Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at the uh, the things we need, basically, to start doing scattering problems with our Dirac theory. So the first thing we need are the Heisenberg uh, operators for our fields. So to get those, we just do what we've done before. We just take the Schrodinger picture operators and just take our exponential terms, and um, instead of the three vector p dot x, we do the four vector p dot x, and we change the sign. And uh, so those are our, our Heisenberg fields. Uh, then, so just for the fun of it, you can show that these fields uh, satisfy the Heisenberg equation of motion. So we have our Hamiltonian from before and our field. So if we, uh, you know, just compute the Heisenberg equation of motion, we get this. Uh, so we have these four terms, and then you could use basically these uh, relations if you uh, want to go through all of it. And uh, so then it reduces to this, and then you use the, the uh, anti-commutation relations and you, you end up getting this thing. So psi dot should be this, which uh, is in line with this expression that we have above. So I'm only going through it quickly because it's not entirely vital uh, to move on, but it's uh, just something interesting to show that our field satisfies the Heisenberg equation of motion. And uh, so what is important, or... Um, are the propagators and leading, uh, we're going to need the, you know, the Feynman propagator to define our uh, time ordering operation. So there was a similar thing in, um, you know, for the real scalar field, we defined the propagator as the commutator of phi of x and phi of y. And you can work that out. And so I if you, so here we do the anti-commutator of psi and psi bar will be our propagator. And if we, oh, so the first thing, um, you know, this, so the anti-commutator, it's this plus this, or, or this times this plus this times this. And that makes it seem like, um, I was confused at first because it's like psi times psi bar with psi on the left will be, that's like an outer product, so it's like a matrix, but then psi bar times psi is scalar. So you're kind of, it seems like you're adding a matrix and a scalar and it's confusing, but basically this anti-commutator doesn't act on the spinners. They just act on the uh, creation and annihilation operators. So you just pull those inside the uh, Fourier expansion of the fields. And um, so the, I, there's four terms again, but the anti-commutator of this and this is zero, and this and this is zero, so only two are left. Uh, so uh, so uh, yeah, so you get this. And then from here, you just use the anti-commutation relations for B and C. So basically, and this expression, Q will just become P, and R will just become S. And uh, you know with this, and then um, so then you use the outer product relation for U S and U bar S, which is just these matrices, and then you can write this uh, like like this, which is a similar kind of expression we got for the propagator. Oh, sorry, and then D of x minus y is this term, and we saw this same exact term pop up for the real scalar field. And so in there, the propagator was just this. It was just this thing, basically. There wasn't this um, operator here. Um, but so what uh, Tong points out that seems important is uh, in for the scalar theory, um, we basically the commutator determines whether or not 
the fields can interact, can affect each other. So um, you would expect that the commutator of 5x and 5y should be zero outside the light cone. And since the propagator went as the commutator of psi of x and psi of y, and um, it, when you are outside the light cone, this does vanish, uh, it was a sign that that theory was, um, you know, Lorentz invariant. But here, so still the thing that you would do to check and see if the fields are, uh, can affect each other is still the commutator. But now this propagator that we've worked out is, um, it's, it goes as the anti-commutator of these fields. And this is zero outside the light cone, but that doesn't tell us that the commutator of these fields is zero outside the light cone. And in fact, it isn't, probably. It's not, no, it's not. Um, but so that seems bad at first, but uh, basically what Tong argues is that in our theories, we never have just um, you know single field operators. We always have the operators squared, so things like this, or you know psi bar times psi. And these products of operators, they do commute with each other. So I wanted to show that. So I did a little bit of investigating to see if that was true and. You can see all the math I did here, but basically in the end, um, I get that it does go as the anti-commute, there's two terms at the end, after I've simplified everything, it goes as the anti-commutator of the fields, and those are of course zero, so there should be zero minus zero. So it does seem to, if I've done this all right, it do, this does seem to vanish. And so as long as you have uh, products of the spinner fields in your Lagrangian uh, it should be Lorentz invariant. Uh, so okay, so now the, if the really the only very important thing uh, in regards to going forward is that we have um, well one is the Heisenberg forms of our operators, but two is going to be the Feynman propagator, which is defined similarly to how it was. For the real scalar field, only the only difference there is that there's a minus sign here. And um, yeah, and again, you can write this in a more compact notation. So there's two cases based on which you know time is earlier, which coordinate time is earlier, and that can be you know compactly written here based on this contour integral. And so you just choose different contours based on whether or not x naught is greater than y naught, or vice versa. And so this is the term that will be, you know, popping up in our expressions for uh, the amplitudes for scattering. And our so similar to before, our time ordering operator will be defined as the normal ordered operators plus all possible contractions, which, for the case of two fields, is just one possible contraction. And again, the contraction is just the Feynman propagator of, you know, in this case, x minus y. Uh, and again, so an important thing to remember is that it, unlike in the scalar theory, here, um, so all of our operators will anti-commute under the time ordering operator and the normal ordering operator. So that'll be important to remember when you're manipulating things, otherwise you'll mess up the minus signs. So uh, I think that's basically all we need and we can continue on and just do some scattering.